yeah all right so so here we are we have um, anita nickerson who is executive director of air vote canada talking about uh, uh, citizens assembly on electoral reform and uh uh, be noted that this meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, the next slide. Is we are doing the chalice lighting. So it's a Unitarian tradition to do chalice lighting because it's a symbol of um, light. And uh, we want to spread that. Uh, uh, basically, we are a non-denominational uh, uh, religion, if you want to say it that way. Basically, we don't have a creed, but we have principles. And um, uh, we believe in the individual belief of, uh, uh, of the right of individual belief, basically. Um, each lighting of our chalice opens us to the beauty of the flame and the power of its silence dance. Today, may our light glow on our commitment to love, equity, and justice. And then the land acknowledgement. We respectfully recognize and acknowledge the relationship that the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis across Canada have with the land all Canadians live on and enjoy. This acknowledgement should only be a first step in eventually coming to restoring unceded land to the indigenous nation or nations that previously had sovereignty over these lands. Uh, so the agenda of today's meeting, we have some talk and exchange about social justice issues, which might be an inspiration for others. Uh, with also the intention, how can we support the petitions or in other ways? So Frances is not here because she is at the protest right now. Uh, so I will read her uh, uh, thing about the ongoing injustice saga of Hassan Diab. Uh, also, she had, uh, she's at the protest right now regarding the destruction of the old growth forest in BC. Uh, Jim will talk about the 35-year-old uh, Unitarian Bean project that is ongoing. Uh, Margaret Rao uh, uh, is at the moment also at the protest. I mean, everybody's so busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Canadian Power of Women for Peace. And Jake uh, will talk about the dysfunctional proportional electoral system of Israel. And we have uh, then the keynote address, and Andy uh, uh, will introduce Anita uh, uh, to speak. And then after that, uh, which will be around uh, um, uh, two o'clock, uh, question and answer. And then we use the raise hand feature uh, to queue up, and we ask you to have just two minutes a person. And, uh, and that is that for that, the agenda. Now, um, on behalf of uh, Francis Devereaux uh, in the name of, uh, it is so shocking that the saga of injustice continues. I remember when Trudeau brought Hassan Diab back after three years in prison, he said it was a travesty of, injust of, of justice. But now he won't guarantee the app won't be extradited again if he's found guilty in a trumped up trial in France without him being there. I just signed a petition, protect Hassan Diab from further injustice. Say no to any future request for Hassan's extradition. It would mean a lot to me if you took a moment to add your name to the petition. And uh, what we will do is, uh, with, with all these things, we will send all participants, actually probably go out for everybody that we invited to have these uh, links so that you can uh, act upon it. Um, so that was Frances. And then Frances again about the old girl forest where she is at. She is in the bus going to the protest against the destruction of a uh, of the old growth forest in BC. And she says, we have left three 
80% of our old growth forest. They plan to delay action till most of the rest is gone, all while saying they are going to save it. It's all in the definitions. Is old growth a few big trees that can be left standing while everything else is cut? Or is it an entire living ecosystem, all interconnected and interdependent habitat for fish, animals, and birds, plants, and fungi? Our forest industry is at a major crossroads. It has been over, it has been cutting for years. We are out of wood at the scale they are cutting. By the way, we will see if we can arrange a, a, a movie showing of the uh, issue of tissue or find a link to it post uh, for you, okay? Uh, because that, uh, that, that film tells it all. They use the forest even for toilet paper and wood pallets in England. Uh, by the way, the photo is uh, from CBC News, Ancient Forest Alliance uh, uh, campaigner, Ian Illuminato is standing next to the tree. I mean, it shows how big those trees are. And it's a photo by TJ Watt. Uh, yesterday, we had the pleasure of uh, <clears throat> using our remainder of fundraisings we've done and came basically to almost a halt during COVID. Uh, we did one delivery, I think, during COVID. Um, and we have not done much fundraising for this, but uh, we delivered 4,000 pounds of dry beans to the Cambridge Food Bank on behalf of the Stratford, Elora and Fergus Unitarians. Uh, this is uh, the photo is a part of our shipment of 80 bags of uh, 25 kilograms. Uh, so that's uh, me and Jim and uh, in between us, uh, Brandy use of the food bank. Uh, we promoted this project for uh, 35 years and have supplied the food banks with more than 100,000 pounds of beans, uh, not turkeys. This is a, a project that started in at Northwest uh, Toronto Fellowship when we were asked to donate uh, to a turkey fund uh, at Christmas for the food bank. And most uh, committee members were vegetarians, so that didn't go over very well. <laughs> and the fact that beans were an underrated source of protein at the time. And, uh, and basically that is how it started. It's a, it's a long story. But we kept on doing it. First, we pack it, packaged up everything and recipes and so forth. But then the food bank said, no, no, we just want the beans. And uh, first, they didn't want them. They didn't even know what to do with them. But now, over all these decades, uh, dry beans are the top commodity at food banks, uh, surpassing peanut butter. And I think we have, uh, we have a little bit something to do with that. And, uh, uh, Jim even was uh, was uh, interviewed on the radio uh, about uh, 15 or 20 years ago by Andy Blair. Uh, not Andy Blair, Andy Berry. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was, uh, it's good. It's still ongoing, but we have to find some other people to take over with that project at some point. Then the Canadian voice of uh, Women for Peace, uh, Margaret Rao, is also at the protest right now at Queen's Park, Toronto. Uh, Canadian voice for Women for Peace, also known as the voice of women for, uh, or, or vow, vowpeace.com, uh, is a Canadian anti-nuclear pacifist organization that was formed uh, in 1960, and the organization was created in response to an article in which uh, Lotta Dempsey, a journalist for the Toronto Star, called out for action against the threat of nuclear war and asked uh, women to work together for peace. After the article was published, a group of women contacted Dempsey and uh, formed a women's uh, organization called Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. The organization's work has spanned multiple de decades and is Canadian's oldest feminist peace group. Tamara Lawrence, is, uh, who was our speaker uh, last month, is a regular contributor to the webinars. And here we see uh, uh, Margaret uh, and other unit uh, CSJers also. 
being part of this uh, this uh, uh, movement. Then we have uh, Jake Jake uh, to talk about five minutes, uh, uh, please, Jake. And then after that, uh, Andy Blair will introduce our speaker, and I will stop sharing now so that uh, 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 Jake can talk now. Okay. Thank okay, you. Jake, go ahead. You can hear me well. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, in regard to Israel specifically, they have the representative electoral, electoral representation, which it may be that the rest of us and other countries would think, well, this is beautiful. Everybody has the right and the power to be in the parliament if it gets takes the votes. But really, in reality, it's not right to compare Israel's system, which is fine, principally, to other countries. And why? Because Israel, first of all, uh, is fragmented society like no other. We Many people may not know it, and they look at Israel so beautiful, so this, so all together, the Jews, and so on. It's not so. Every election, between 33 to 40 parties running for election. Why is that? Because, for example, in the religious section, you have about half a dozen different religious factions. The same thing goes for ethnics. You have the Russian vote, you have the Moroccan vote, you have all kinds of them. And everyone hates the guts of the other one. They're really never been united. The only thing, the only way that they're united, it's against the Palestinians. So in the last election, Netanyahu wanted power again. He is power hungry, he has a tremendous ego. But by now, most or many Israelis were against him totally. They hated his guts. The only way that he could uh, get to power or try to get to power, it was to make a coalition or talk to those religious fanatics, to extremists in Israel, fascists, which Israelis call them, fascists, homophobes, racist, and so on. Those are the only one that would go with him to get some majority, hopefully. And therefore, he offered them all kind of privilege, all kind of uh, laws to restrict the life in Israel, to make it more religious, all kind of laws to expand the settlements, and so on and so forth, a lot of things. And he promised them ministerial uh, portfolios. So what happened in Israel now that there is so much upheaval and that's among the most secular and liberals, it's because the coalition of Netanyahu wants to strip the power of the uh, of the Supreme Court. Israel doesn't have a constitution. That has a different reason why it was against the Palestinians. But since it doesn't have a constitution, the Supreme Court is the only power in Israel that can have checks and balances against the government doing something that is inappropriate totally. That's the only one have that power. Now, the new a coalition of Netanyahu, the extremists there, they want to strip that power from the Supreme Court. And that's why it's there is so much upheaval in Israel. And it has nothing to do with Palestinians. Israelis, both sides, they don't care about the Palestinians. It's never mentioned, never mentioned in the far past five elections. So I'm just looking at my <laughs> notes here. So they really want to get those powers because that will be very important 
for them to further their agenda, but it's certainly against, mostly, most certainly against Palestinians because they want to build thousands and thousands of more settlements, want to expel some of them, all kind of, but they are also against the Israeli secular themselves. More so, there are two leaders there. One of them is Netanyahu, the other one is Ben Gvir. Netanyahu has for years now going uh, investigation into his corruption, which he's trying to avoid. And the other one is Itamar Ben Gvir, which was a terrorist by Israeli uh, definition. He was not even allowed to serve in the army at the time. But now he got the power to be the minister in charge of the police and in charge of the Palestinians. And both of those have a good reason personally to strip the power of the ju judicial system of the Supreme Court. In the whole process here, had, as I said, nothing to do with Palestinians. There are 20% of the population in Israel that never been asked to participate in those demonstrations or anything. So it's purely Israeli things that they are afraid of what's going to happen to them. All right. Jake, there are some questions in the chat for yes, you. Yes, just one second. I'm going to finish this. One okay. second, please. All right. All right. So as I started the proportional representation in Israel, it's not really can be extrapolated into the Canadian system because that's totally fragmented society, dysfunctional society most of the time contrary to what we hear and we think. So on. it's very basically ugly society. They all just hate each other. They all pull into different direction. The uh, religious parties, for example, they don't care anything. They don't care about Israel itself. They just want power for themselves, privileges for themselves and so on. So I'm not sure that to say, look at, they have, the system of uh, proportional representation, it can work. Canada is different. Yes, in Canada, it can work, but not to take example of Israel. Thank you. Ellen, you're muted again. Yeah, I'm muted again, sorry. Thank you, Andy. I just saw that myself. I think oh, I'm talking into the air here. Uh, there are some chat, uh, questions in the chat, and there is a raised hand. Uh, the questions in the chat is um, uh, or remarks. Uh, does the does not the Knesset at least theoretically have oversight powers as well? It's from Steve Farrer. Farrer. If the Knesset has power to do what? I don't know. Uh, uh, unmute yourself, Steve, and elaborate. I don't know if, is he still here? Yes. I okay, think. anyway, the Knesset has power to legislate laws and all kinds of things. Yes, of course. But if they do things that are not proper, for example, what this Netanyahu and his party, his coalition want to do, the Supreme Court is the only one that has power to override anything they think it's not appropriate. And that's what now those extremists want to take it away. Okay. Can, can I another... add to that quickly? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I was getting at as well was that because of the underpinning democratic structure, even if even if it doesn't work as well as we would like, my understanding is that Knesset does have the power, if they have the votes, to 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 have an impact on the uh, the policies. And uh, 
You're mm -hmm. suggesting that only the Supreme Court can really make a difference? No, absolutely. I did not say that, or I, did, I made a mistake maybe. The government, which is democratically elected, has the power to do many, many things, all kind of legislation, everything. The Supreme Court does not interfere, but only it has the power in case there is rise up and there is really laws that the government at the time wants to bring on, they have the power to question it and maybe say, no, this is not going to fly like this, either change the legislation or not. But uh, that, that, so that's the only power in Israel that there is to oversee the government actions. Um, and uh, Stephen, uh, can you say uh, your thing? Yes, hi. Um, getting back to proportional representation in Israel, I'm. I believe, like what you call a party. Um, or what you call an official party is very important. I believe that in Israel, with only 3.5% of the votes, party is considered an official party. When we look at proportional representation as it relates to Canada, we are talking about anywhere between 5 and 10% uh, of the population to be called an official party. And that would make a big difference in terms of the, what you're talking about um, if, uh, for fragmentation. Um, there would be less fragmentation, hopefully, um, because only it takes five to ten percent of the population to uh, create a voting population to, to create a party. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything you want to say of that, uh, Jake? Or that's okay. No, thank you. Okay, uh, Katerina Lindman is saying, uh, are there not people in Tel Aviv that are sympathetic towards Palestinians? Yes, there are. There are many Israelis, many. Well, it's <laughs> there are some Israelis who are totally against what's going on against the Palestinians. You have about four or five different groups of activists, wonderful people and they publishing all the time and trying to teach others and so on that they are against the occupation because the occupation is the main problem in Israel, okay? This corrupts the soul of the Israelis totally. So there are many Israelis that are against, but their power is minimal. And if they really come out and talk or say things openly, they are immediately decimated by other uh, extremists. So that's the, the, the thing. There is, there is there are nice people, but very small group at the moment. Almost there's no left now exist in Israel. And that's the problem because the ones that are on the left, they have to keep quiet. The power of the extremist is growing by leaps and bounds. Thank you, Jake. Uh, thank you for your insight. Um, we are running out of time uh, for, for a speaker, but if, if there's any issues that you would like to, uh, uh, to mention, you can speak now for uh, one or two minutes and, and then, then it's over, uh, or send me or send us uh, uh, your issues and we will address them in the big mailing that we will do to all of you of uh, current issues that uh, have to be addressed and to ha uh, helped out with. I don't see any hand raising here. So in that case, I would hand it over to uh, Andy and you could say something that you said in the chat also and then uh, introduce uh, Anita, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Helen. I'll keep things very brief. Uh, I could say a lot here because uh, I've known Anita for many years. I think uh, I joined Federal Canada in the mid 2000s, became vice president, and that's where I first met Anita in about 2010, 2011, when she was a local organizer for Fair Vote. And like many people in the organization and activism and uh, electoral reform, she got sucked up to the mothership, so to speak. And we joined the board of Fair Vote 
um, where she quickly distinguished herself as one of the more level-headed and practical people on the board. She's been many things in her life, uh, a mother, a community activist, a small business person, but what she's always been is somebody who really connects well with people and she's good at getting things done. So after many adventures and misadventures, including even in the pizza business, uh, she was a logical choice uh, for to, to become the executive director of Canada's National Electoral Reform Organization, Fairville Canada, which a role which she assumed in 2018. Now, it's no surprise that Anita was originally trained and worked as an addictions counselor. So today she is trying to get all Canadians to kick their bad habit to a dysfunctional voting system. And I'd like you to welcome with me Anita Nickerson to speak with us. We're very glad to have her today. Anita. Thank you, Andy. That's wonderful. I don't usually get an introduction like that. It makes me feel like an important person. <laughs> when I came, <laughs> when I came into Fairboat, Andy was already here and he was an inspiration to me. And um, I wish he was still on the board. Just FYI, the board elections are coming up, Andy. Yeah. Get the itch to come back. <laughs> we could use you. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining me. I have a presentation and I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to apologize to those of you who have seen this before and and those of you who have seen this countless times before. I'm here with all, with friends here, but I'm also here for the people who haven't seen it. So one thing I've learned in Fairboat is no matter what kind of audience you have, you can't assume that people know this stuff. So I have to start back with what is going to be patently obvious to a group of you in this room. And then I'm hoping during the discussion period, we can talk more about uh, the current campaign that we're on, what kind of help we need, and I can talk more about the Citizens Assembly um, at that time. So I'm going to share my screen and see if I can get um, that to work. Give me one second here. So I go over to my UU presentation, share, share, and I'm navigating that little black bar that Ellen was talking about, slideshow. Okay, can everybody see this? Yeah, perfect, okay. So like Andy said, I'm Anita, I'm the executive director of Fairvote. I've been working in Fairvote as a volunteer for oh, 10, 12 years, I got first got the um, it hit the thing hit me after the 2007 referendum in Ontario, only about 10 lifetimes ago. Um, I thought, wow, this is a great idea. Canada should do that. And once I get an idea, I get really fixated on it and I just go, go, go. So I've been go, go, going since around 2009, 2010 on this. So Fairboat Canada, if you don't know us, we are a national nonprofit Citizens Organization for Proportional Representation. So we have volunteers across the country. We're almost entirely volunteers. We have two staff, one's me, the other one is a lady that calls our uh, monthly donors to make sure they give us their updated credit card information so that we can keep doing the things that we do. But really we are an army of volunteers. So uh, I'm taking this presentation from the one I did for the Dawn Heights group, so you got you, those of you that were there will see the overlap, and, but there's been some new developments since then. I'll be able to talk about them later. So when I was thinking about doing this presentation for UU, I just sort of wanted to connect it to Unitarians. Um, Unitarians have been long, long time supporters of Fair Vote Canada. I always see many familiar faces among our volunteers who are also Unitarians. So when I looked at, you know, what are some of the core Unitarian principles? How do they relate to the core Fair Vote Canada principles? You can see why so many Unitarians are attracted to the issue of proportional representation, where the overlap would be around equality, around the idea that, um, you know, we have an interdependent web of existence. It really ties in with the idea that everything affects everyone and everybody needs to work together. Again, uh, Unitarians have the use of democratic processes built right into your core principles, which really overlaps with Fair Vote Canada and our push for not just proportional representation, but also for citizens assemblies, which give people uh, more of a democratic voice. And 
here are some of the people that I picked out, and I know there are more that I know through Unitarian and through Fair Vote Canada. Francis Deverell um, has been wonderful, and most of the people I'm looking at here have been involved with us for a very, very long time, and I see Kim Gomery here in the picture as well. Uh, myself, I'm not a Unitarian right now, but I used to be involved with the Unitarians and I still have a fond feeling for all things Unitarian. Maybe one day I'll get back into it when I'm retired and I'm not doing Fairboat Canada like 20 hours a day. Um, but back when I was young in this picture, uh, when we had our baby, Rebecca, uh, I was involved in the Unitarian Fellowship in Sarnia and that's Wendy Starr who did her dedication ceremony. And the funny thing about Wendy, um, you can see the age difference in the two pictures of Wendy there is uh, about two elections ago, we were doing a door hanger campaign and I put out a call for people to do door hangers in Sarnia and guess who signed up but Wendy Starr that I hadn't heard from really for 20 years. So, you know, just that continuity of people that care about the same thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the part that many of you have heard before, but it may be new to some of you. So I'm going to just go over the basic case for what's wrong with our voting system. Why didn't we need proportional representation? I'm going to end off. Um, in the discussion more talking about our current campaign and I'm really excited to have everybody here um, that could possibly help us with this campaign. I'm really excited about it. It's, it's winnable, which is for us a big thing. So to just back up, what is proportional representation? It just means that if you get about 30% of the votes, you get about 30% of the seats. It's really not complicated. Um, it's just a principle. The other way you can think of it is like a family of systems. So there's like different families of voting systems in the world. And I've oversimplified this, but basically it boils down to there are winner take all systems and there are proportional systems. And within each family, you can have all kinds of different designs and that kind of thing. But the point of these systems is totally different. The point of a proportional system is to accurately reflect how people voted. The point of a winner take all system is just to give all the party the power to whoever wins in the riding, which usually results in giving all the power to one party to make decisions. So there's sort of different, uh, totally different philosophies. So a few problems with our first past the post winner take all voting system. And keep in mind that these problems apply to all winner take all systems. Um, it's not, one of them isn't really much better than the other one. So the first problem is obviously the fact that most of us in Canada, the majority of us, cast votes that do absolutely nothing. As one of our longtime activists used to say, it's like you're pushing the button for the elevator, but the elevator is not coming. And that's uh, the experience of most voters in Canada. So that may just seem like, well, isn't that how it works, right? There's winners, there's losers, somebody has to win, somebody has to lose. But actually, no, if you look at most modern democracies, about 80% of OECD countries, um, yeah, it's not just Israel for sure. 80% <laughs> of OECD countries, including you know the top performing economies, uh, the top performing democracies use PR. And in those countries, almost every vote counts. Not every vote, but almost every vote counts. That means that voter cast a ballot that had some impact on how the parliament uh, and who sits in parliament and has somebody that they may feel represents their values. So a major problem we have with false majority governments, and I'm sure those of you who are in Ontario with me are living the dream right now with this false majority government, is that most of the time in Canada, we have a single party that gets about 40% of the vote, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. That translates into 55 to 60% of the seats, which translates into 100% of the power. And we can see this. Uh, the last two majority governments at the federal level in Canada have been uh, false majorities like this. And it really I mean we're in a period right now of minority governments, which many of us look upon as a good thing. But the long history is that that's, that's not going to last. We're going to have another false majority government again, and it's only a matter of time. So another problem with first past the post is the distorted results. And this is related to false majorities, but it goes well beyond that. So the, I'm gonna just run through, I could like spend about a half hour on different examples, but I think I've picked out a couple here. 
And here you can see in 2008, this is before the Green Party of Canada was able to pick up its first seat. You can see that the Bloc and the Greens got had almost the same number of voters in Canada, but the Bloc voters got represented by 49 MPs and the Green voters in Canada got represented by absolutely nobody. So when you look at examples like that, you can see um, how undemocratic or unrepresentative this system is. Another problem we have, safe seats and swing ridings. So if you live in a seat where the party uh, who has your riding could you know, run a lamppost or paint a donkey and they would still win that riding, you are in a safe seat. You and many, many, many other Canadians, some of whom uh, write to me and tell me, I'm 95 years old. I'm not kidding here, I get these emails. I'm 95 years old and I voted in every single election since I've eight, I'm 18 and I've never elected anybody. And I just wanna see this happen before I die. That's, I get those emails and I've been getting them for over a decade. And that's because they often live in a safe seat where you don't really matter. And so here we can see in the Hill Times, uh, the last, after the last election where, you know, Trudeau who called a snap election early trying to win his 39% majority back because he didn't really wanna have to cooperate with anybody. Um, talking about, you know, how they, they lost that majority by, you know, a handful of votes and a handful of ridings. And those are the people, unfortunately, that matter in elections. It's those, that small micro-targeted segment of voters that the big parties are after to get their majority. And this is an old slide, um, but, oh, 2015, not that old. Anyway, so this is the Stratcom uh, advertising a product basically spelling it out, saying political parties aren't focused on every voter in every riding, only those that matter. Exactly. So if you don't live in a handful of those swing ridings, you just don't really matter in our electoral system. Now, this is a huge consequence of first past the post, and this is the kind of thing that gets a lot of people involved in proportional representation to begin with, because they start seeing that it's not really about parties and it's not about numbers and math and all this kind of stuff. It's about real life consequences on issues that matter um, to Canadians, issues that matter to people's daily lives. So policy lurch just refers to what happens when one false majority government is replaced by a different false majority government of a different ideology. And here we see the huge problem with all winner-take-all systems is that you can get these drastic shifts in policy. And I mean, this is no more and more obvious than on, on climate, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that a little later in the presentation. But these swings uh, are wild and they can result in undoing a lot of work that the previous government did, a lot of work that hardworking activists like some people in this group have done on different issues. So here's an example in Ontario, uh, where when Doug Ford got elected in the last, not 2022, 2018, he went on to immediately, you know, get us out of the cap and trade program and he canceled 758 renewable energy contracts and boom, you know, uh, the, as insufficient as perhaps the efforts were on climate in the last 10 years, uh, they basically went right down the toilet and we are looking at another four years of that in Ontario. So it really sets us back. So now I'm gonna look at some of the research evidence for proportional representation. And again, I've just picked out a few things. And if you go on our website and click on the look at the evidence link, you can see the whole thing, there's a lot more than this. So the first thing to understand is the way we look at it is the voting system is like the root of the tree. So it's at the root of policy making, who gets represented in parliament, who has a voice, uh, you know, how are policies made? That's like, it's a process issue. So it's, it's not like, you know, when Doug Ford's trying to pave over the green belt, you know, you're gonna have a thousand people marching on the side of a road with a sign, right? It's hard for us with a process issue to get people to do that, obviously, right? But really, that's the bottom line. That's how we ended up with this problem in the first place, is that's how decisions are made. So when we look at measures of democracy, the foundational work was done by a man by the name of Aaron Leipart. And he's done two editions of this book. He must be getting quite, he must be at least 80 by now. And he testified to the Electoral Reform Committee in 2016. And he looked at, I think it was 
oh yeah, there you go, 36 countries. And he looked at them over two periods of about 25 years each in his two editions of the book. And basically what he found is that the proportional countries outperformed the winner-take-all countries on every single measure of democracy. So every, everything, you know, from representation to accountability, you know, everything you can imagine, the PR countries were on average doing better. Another thing that we noticed in PR countries, and again, um, it's not always the case. So I'm not, I don't want to say, oh, we're going to get PR and it's going to be like a fairy tale in our parliament. Everybody with common sense can see that's not the case. You can just look at YouTube videos and find uh, politicians in PR countries throwing chairs at each other. I mean, it's not, it's not like we're all going to hold hands and sing kumbaya. But the, the reality is in PR countries, because the parties have to cooperate and they have to cooperate all the time, in many countries where you, where you don't have these kind of unique divisions like Jake was talking about that happened in Israel, it results in a much more um, civil and cooperative political culture. And somebody did a, st a study looking at eight, I wouldn't want to be this researcher, he looked at 821,000 speeches from MPs in the New Zealand parliament before and after they switched to PR. And basically, uh, he found that the level of hostility went down. Because when you know that you might have to be working with that person in the next parliament, that really gives you an incentive not to be attacking them uh, so much in this parliament. And again, there's new research uh, just out this past year looking at, again, how, how voters feel towards different parties. And they, they found that voters, you know how, um, well, particularly in the United States, right? How it's so polarized. And we're seeing that more and more, unfortunately, here in Canada, where, you know, I get so much hate mail. I'm just, that's changed over the past two years. So many angry people, swearing, abusive people who just hate anything that they feel has to do with another party. So what they, the researchers have found in countries with PR is that uh, people feel warmer towards any party that their preferred party has worked with. And that goes back 15 years. So it just sort of um, takes out of that, that feeling of demonizing the opponent to being just used to working together. Or maybe the other party isn't so bad. We have some things in common. And here you can see how this works. This is a little bit geeky, so I'm going to just sort of explain to you what this is. So in, remember we talked about the policy lurch, right, where you have one government, and then it gets replaced by the opposite government, and the policies go back and forth. What you get in a proportional country is often, because there are coalition governments, there will be a continuing partner. And what that does is it evens out those swings. So even when you have a you know, a sort of a major change in the direction of the government, it's not as bad because there is a continuing partner. And here I've contrasted that with what we've seen in Ontario. And in the last German election, we wrote a blog on this, which our supporters really seem to enjoy because real life examples are, are worth a lot of statistics. Uh, you know, on election night, right, uh, the three parties who sort of won the election, you know, which is uh, the Social Democrats, the Free Democrats, I might be getting that one wrong, memory's gone now, and the Green Party basically said, you know what, the citizens gave us a mandate to form a government together. And that's because these three parties had something in common. Uh, people, you know, had a good idea that they were going to work together, and they were upfront about it, and they had a majority of the votes together you know, which we can contrast with the last election in Canada, where actually it was this election or the election before, where Justin Trudeau said on election night that Canadians were sending him and the Liberal team back to work with a clear mandate, a clear mandate with 32.6% of the vote. So you wouldn't see that in a country with proportional representation because their idea of what a mandate is a little bit different. And here we see another wonderful example in New Zealand where the Labour Party actually won an outright majority for the first time in New Zealand with PR in the last election. Uh, Jacinda Ardern won uh, almost 50% of the vote. It's not quite a proportional system. She was right hovering on 50%. She won a majority of seats. She didn't need to govern with anybody else. She could have just gone it alone. Why wouldn't she? 
uh, but she invited the Greens to have ministers in her government. And that's because over 20 years, they're aware that when you build broader supports for policies and you cooperate, your policies are more likely going to last. And here, of course, we have sort of like what's the ultimate contrast to the picture I showed you of Justin Trudeau and his 32% mandate. Here you have the uh, Finland's five-party government all led by women. Okay. So on social justice issues, proportional countries have been shown overall to do better. I just need to move up my little uh, bar so I can see what I'm doing again. There we go. Okay, so uh, one long time finding, it's been replicated over and over again, is that proportional representation is associated with more income redistribution, lower income inequality. And as we know from all the writing that's been done in the past 10 years, income inequality is a huge thing and it causes all kinds of problems. So a, a proportional system helps even that out. Proportional systems have also been shown to have uh, have better health outcomes. So there's there's been quite a about three different studies now showing that countries with PR do better on population health. People live longer. There's lower infant uh, infant mortality. There's, there's even a study looking at uh, what happens in one country as some of their districts switch to PR and showing how the health outcomes improved compared to the districts that didn't switch to PR. And I think that was in Switzerland, which was really neat because it was a within within one country proof. Okay, and here's something that's important to probably a lot of people that are joining this webinar. It's very important to me. It was what got me into this whole thing, uh, the environment. So countries with PR, they have stricter environmental policies. They're able to act faster on climate change. They do better on a wide range of environmental performance. They use more renewable energy. And there was new research that came out last year uh, on showing that climate policy is better protected from the influence of the far right in countries with proportional representation. And again, this goes back to, um, it goes back to the idea of fewer extreme policy shifts. So it may not be that often that you get a, uh, you know, I'm just gonna pick, you know, a, a Donald Trump, you know, it's not that often that happens, but when it does happen in winner-take-all countries, it can set your policy back a crazy amount. And in countries with PR, uh, it's the policy, they found that the policy really didn't, it didn't have any effect. So climate policy is protected. And just throwing this one in because of the group that I'm in today, Electoral Assistance and Peace. So here was a study, it's about 20 years old now, but there's two different studies on this where they looked at 138 countries over about 40 years and found that um, all the instances of civil war occurred in countries with winner-take-all systems. And another study showing that a country's voting system was the most important predictor of involvement in war, how long they stayed in a war. Um, and this sort of makes sense because proportional representation is the system recommended for divided societies. So when you look at somewhere like, you know, Israel, right, it's easy to say, you know, and Jake made a great case for saying, you know, what you're seeing in Israel is just a reflection of what you're seeing in society. So you don't get rid of those problems by imposing a winner-take-all system. What you do is you make those problems worse. You take one small group and say, guess what, instead of this uh, having to work it out or whatever or not, uh, we'll just give one group a disproportionate amount of the power to be able to make laws for everybody else. You can just probably use your common sense and understand how that could create far worse problems. And so that's why, for example, um, in Northern Ireland, part of the P PR was part of their peace deal. And here's, I'm just reinforcing that proportional representation is by far the most common principle behind voting systems in most of the OECD. So a uh, most recent election here was in Denmark uh, just last year. And this we found this really, really interesting, at least I did. Uh, Meta Fredrickson, I'm learning to say Meta. If it has an E on the end, you say an A at the end. This is my learning of this week. Um, 
So Meta Fredrickson, she is the Social Democratic Prime Minister. Uh, after the election, she had more more votes. Her party had more votes and more seats than they had last time. So the left wing bloc would have been able to govern again with a with a more with more seats. But instead, what she decided to do is she stepped down and said, "I want to form a broader coalition because we have these huge problems: the war in Ukraine, the pandemic." You know, the whole thing. I want to form a coalition that's uh, even broader than usual in Denmark across party lines, across left, right. And it took them probably, I don't know, I think six weeks of negotiation, which is unusual in Denmark. Usually it's like a week. And they did form that broad coalition. So how it works out, we'll see. But the reason I'm pointing out, pointing that out is just to say that that's um, that culture of collaboration and cooperation and bringing as many different perspectives into the tent as possible is something that more and more PR countries are doing as we're seeing the end of these two party or two right left blocks and we're seeing more of these broad coalition governments. So there was a study by Cambridge University in 2020 and they showed that um, satisfaction with democracy all over the democratic world is, is down, 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 down. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen these kind of reports. Um, but the countries where satisfaction had actually gone up were all countries with proportional representation, and they pointed to that as one of the reasons. Okay. Oh, and here we can see in Denmark, uh, the last Denmark election, almost everybody helped elect somebody to the parliament. And here you can see uh, votes match seats pretty closely. And I had an interesting conversation back in the fall with uh, Rune Stubacher, who's going to be on a webinar with us in a few months. I'm putting one together. It's taken me like a long time because it's Denmark, right? Um, but one thing he was talking about is how they make legislation in Denmark because they have proportional representation is so different. So when there's a major piece of legislation, the government goes to all the parties, including the opposition parties, and says, okay, you know, what are your thoughts? What would you like to see? And they negotiate something with as many parties as they can. It's not this adversarial who's going to vote for the budget. Is the, is the you know is everything going to fall apart today? And you know where we see in Canada, whoever's the opposition will just oppose for the sake of opposing. Uh, they have these co these conversations because, like he said, influencing policy is basically the only game in town. There is no other game because you can't get all the power yourself. So you want to spend your political capital trying to get something that you want in the legislation, which makes the legislation obviously more broadly representative. And here we can see on climate, this was from BBC about two years ago, during the pandemic. This was about three months into the pandemic when in Canada, we weren't doing too much other than pandemic. Denmark managed to pass the strongest climate legislation in the world that was negotiated by nine parties. So where are we now? So because this is, I had to start with all the, the, I had to do all the basic stuff. I didn't get to talk about citizens assemblies and things like that, that I would love to talk about. Uh, but I want to tell everybody what's going on right now. And that's why I'm excited to be here. Uh, so for the last four years, we have been, four or five years, we have been pushing for a national citizens assembly on electoral reform because asking the parties, the big parties in particular, um, to design a new electoral system is like asking the turkeys to plan the Thanksgiving dinner. It doesn't go well, and it hasn't gone well since 1921 when, when we had the first all-party committee to nowhere. Um, so we've been pushing for a process that would take this out of the hands of politicians, at least for the first step. So we do not get to the no consensus part uh, right away. <laughs> so. The Citizens Assembly is like a representative group. It's a mini public. It's people that are selected randomly like a jury. It's independent, it's nonpartisan, and it would help us get away from this, this idea that people have that, it, that electoral reform is about the Green Party or something like that. So uh, we have somebody that unbeknownst to me is in a liberal riding association and unbeknownst to me did the work in the riding association to bring this through the liberal policy process, it ended up being the most popular resolution in the Liberal Party 
uh, in BC among people who voted on policy resolutions. That made it the fast track resolution. It's going to a vote at the Liberal Party convention May 4th to 6th. So this is pretty incredible for us that thanks to people like you, volunteers who have done this work and done the slogging on this for so many years, that this will be now be voted on by all the delegates at the convention. So I am talking about the prime minister, which who we know is not a fan, um, the prime minister, all the MPs, the staffers, and Liberal Party members. I'm talking about the ones who spend more than $500 to register for this, to go there, to buy, to book a hotel. They will be in a room in May 5th, May 4th to 6th, voting on whether to endorse this resolution from BC to, for, to have the party endorse a National Citizens Assembly electoral reform. So what we are doing right now is we are, you can imagine, we are visiting MPs, all MPs that we know excluding MPs that we know are, are intractable opponents. Um, so we are visiting all MPs. So if you live in a riding with a Liberal MP and would be willing to lead a visit, I can tell you how to sign up because we, we are gonna win this one vote at a time. And the only way we're gonna win it is if we talk to those MPs before somebody else does. So we're talking to riding associations. So you may know somebody on a liberal riding association. Even if you're not a liberal, you may, oh yeah, my friend so-and-so is on the local EDA. If you know that person, put them in touch with me. There's a group of liberals that are going around to riding associations across the country doing presentations on this, getting us one vote at a time. If you don't have a liberal MP, you can send a card to Justin Trudeau. I'm happy to send you the link for that. I'm hoping to get us up to 10,000 cards to Justin Trudeau, which will be delivered before the convention vote. And that is it for me for today. I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover and I'm happy to talk with everybody who wants to chat and ask questions. Oh, thank you very much, Anita. And uh, we will go in the Q&A. I know Jake wants to say something. Jake, we will get you after the Q&A, okay? Right. Uh, so put your hands up if, uh, if you want to uh, say something, and uh, I, I don't know what's going on here. Somehow I have I have still the uh, uh, Anita being spotlit here. I put myself on gallery view for me, but okay, there, there we go. Uh, Andy, uh, you have your hand up. Uh, why don't you go? Yes. Um... Thank you, Anita, for a great talk. And I'm wondering if, um, since you are uh, essentially preaching to the choir, pun intended here, um, and actually I'll, I'll give, a, give you a little story as an aside about that. I was hoping that maybe you could share the presentation, for example, so that we could give a talk about something similar in our own congregations, et cetera, or our own groups that we know, because it's a great talk. It has lots of great points. Um, and I know when I first gave a presentation to my local congregation on this a number of years ago, I was met with a lot of blank stares because they actually didn't know. A lot of Unitarians don't know about this and the problems. And we're all off running, you know, doing organizing protests like I was about this, that, and the other thing, peace, or whether it's refugees or health policy or climate change. We don't realize that this is the root of the problem for many of the things that we're dealing with. And the reason why we keep be beating our head against a brick wall and not getting anywhere with our own policy issues is because of the system itself is flawed. The little story is an aside where fair vote actually led me in one way or another to be to join uh, the Unitarians. It was, I was in Ottawa in the mid 2000s organizing some different protests. One was against uh, George W. Bush's uh, Jr.'s Star Wars plan for putting nuclear weapons in orbiting in space aimed down at us and yada, 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 wanted Canada to join. And so I organized a protest about that and um, then organized, then joined Fair Vote and started organizing uh, uh, um, different events for um, talks for uh, Fair Vote. Uh, the electoral reform issue, including an invitation from the Ottawa congregation to speak there, uh, the Ottawa West one and the, and the Ottawa East one. Anyway, 
these people called Unitarians kept showing up. And I was like, who are these people who are coming to all my activities, protest demonstrations, talks? And so when I moved to Halifax in 2012, 2011, I said, you know what? I'm going to walk in the church there and actually check it out. So that's how I became a Unitarian. Um, so yes, very, obviously very friendly crowd. I'm just wondering if you can provide a presentation and or other ways that we can get involved. Yes, meeting our MPs is one way, but I think we should talk about this with our own uh, fellow people, uh, fellow Unitarians in our own congregations, because this issue cannot go away. I know that it was big in leading up to the 2015 election with Justin Trudeau's, Trudeau's famous promise to reform the voting system. In 2015, he was elected uh, in no small part because of that promise. A lot of young people in particular, polling showed, voted for him uh, based on that promise to change the way things work, to uh, institute elect some form of electoral reform. Of course, we all remember that in 2016, he flip-flopped on that promise and tried has tried since then to sweep the issue under the rug. So I really think that this is still a long going issue and we need to do something about it. I will stop there. Yes. So for sure, Andy, anybody who wants to give a talk like this um, or wants somebody to come and give a talk like this, not necessarily me, but just, I'm happy to send anybody our presentation, various versions of the presentation <laughs> and every, every, uh, 15th of the month, we offer PR 101 too. So you can come check it out. There's a volunteer that does PR 101. And if you want to join the presenters group, by all means. So, I mean, there's the short term and the long term of this, right? Right now, I'm on uh, Energizer Bunny mode for four months trying to win this vote, pay four to six. But yes, the long term is spread the word, talk to groups uh, that you know, ask for an invitation, talk one on one. It all helps. We're about twice as big. We're a small org, but we're twice as big as we were uh, going into that 2016 process. And we're getting new people all the time. So it used to be there. It used to be, you know, the people that would volunteer were like very long time people, and a lot of them are sort of cynical and burnt out because it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. Um, but now we're getting people uh, who don't have that that baggage. They don't. They weren't here in 2016. They they didn't live through that whole heartbreak or various other heartbreaks. That, and they they're like, yeah, we need to do this. And we're getting MPs who are saying, you know what? That was before my time. Can you imagine? So that what I'm saying is a new. It, we're finally moving past that broken promise. And we're moving into a new possibility that, that we could really win this vote. There are so many new MPs and new staffers and new volunteers. Okay. Okay. And then Steve uh, Farah here. So Anita, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate that thorough overview. It was really well well received by myself i'm sure everybody so in british columbia the single transferable vote was was voted on and turned down quite a, several years ago now uh, at that time if i recall correctly there was the electoral reform assembly that had been created that then co did come on i don't remember if they recommended that particular approach but they did recommend proportional so my question is and then it it, it didn't uh, it didn't pass so my question is if if the if the meeting uh, coming up in May recommends to to create an assembly, is there any more guarantee that that the results of the assembly would require the government to to make a change or to do something, or is it just an advisory result from the assembly's uh, proposal? Yeah. So there's obviously there's no magic. So I'm, our our supporters tend to want some kind of magic you know they want to hear that you know we're going to have a citizens assembly and it's going to be binding and somehow we're going to make the politicians change the voting system i'm being realistic with you all here that's that's not the way it's going to work but there's no way you can force the politicians to change the voting system so i mean what we are trying to do is get bigger get stronger get more political support build this movement so that we are in 
ever, when we have the next opportunity and it will come, that we are in a lot stronger position than we are, uh, than we are, than we were in 2015, we were in 2016, you know, and we're getting there. So no, if the, if the Liberals pass um, this resolution for a citizens assembly, which would be like nothing short of a, a possible miracle, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't mean the party has to do it. Justin Trudeau, as you know, is opposed to everything except for his pet winner take all system. Um, so I don't expect, it's not like, oh, we're gonna win this vote and then we'll have the assembly, then we'll get PR, no, no. But try to think of the implication of having the largest party in Canada have an official policy for a national citizens assembly and electoral reform. Think about the implications for that, for the, their campaign platforms, for the MPs, for our lobbying efforts in Parliament, for the time when when we will be able to push this forward, when they own this. I mean, it would just be it would be an incredible thing to strengthen the movement. In terms of if if and when we get a citizens assembly, uh, what power would they have? They don't know. It's advisory power. But what one thing we want that hasn't happened in previous assemblies, and this is sort of like the miss, the missing piece. You need the assembly to build trust among the public. So in 2004, there was an assembly in British Columbia. It was extremely well done. It was a model for the rest of the world. The citizens assemblies have taken off since then. And BC has sort of looked at like, wow, this was the, the first big model of it. Um, and it did win a referendum, even though we didn't get it. It won 58% of the popular vote, but that wasn't enough for the politicians of the day. Uh, but the one thing that one thing we need in addition to the assembly is we need political leadership. If you have a citizens assembly and nobody knows about it, it's useless. What what you end up with is 150 citizens who are burnt out, cynical, and ticked right off at the government. And we've had that before too. So we need the assembly and we need Canadians to know that the assembly is happening. They do not need to follow the intricacies of voting systems. I can guarantee that's a fascination to about 1% of people. But they do need to know that people just like me are, uh, are working on this on my behalf, that it's not coming from a political party. It's coming from citizens that are representative of the public. So that's what we want in the next Citizens Assembly. We need political leadership. We need funding uh, for publicity for the assembly, for education. Those kind of things will increase the chances that we can put enough pressure on the parties that they will negotiate a change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, we have a few minutes more. So if you have, uh, I see two hands up, I have a, uh, question in the chat. I have a question via email if somebody couldn't be here. Uh, if we can keep it uh, down for uh, the question uh, itself down to under a minute, please, then uh, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, my biggest, my biggest concern is like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a NDP -er. I have been for years and I know they're never going to get in, but, you know, Justin Trudeau, the one thing I don't like about him is that he says he's going to do all these things and he doesn't do them. Now, he did very strong and when the pandemic, he, he stepped forward and he did what he had to do. But no, not a lot of people agreed with what was going on. Like there was anti-vaxxers um, and that. And the sad reality is when we're trying to push for him to do this, he'll say, yeah, okay, fine. He'll take it across and then it'll be put on the back burner. So how are we going to really push him to do what we need to do to make sure that our voice is heard? It's a good question. So one thing to, in, in terms of winning this next step, Justin Trudeau is one vote. So, you know, if you think about the people in the room at this convention, okay, there might be 2,000 people there. I'm just guessing, okay? He, he may not like this. We know he doesn't like it. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, right? He doesn't want anything except for his own winner-take-all system, okay? But he hasn't yet come out and said no to this. He hasn't put his foot down and squashed it. And that's why we are on a mission to meet with as many MPs, staffers, and electoral district associations as we can in the next 10 weeks. 
because he is just one vote. So if he decides not to put his big foot down, it's possible that we can sway enough votes to win this. It's different than in it's different than in Parliament where they're all whipped, you know, to vote uh, along with him on this. We already have a handful of MPs that have said that they'll vote for it, which is huge progress from the last uh, from the last six years. I mean, I just got an email from a, a supporter who called her MP in a riding we never had a volunteer before. The MP called her back. This is a Liberal MP um, in Greater Toronto area. Called her back, left a lengthy message on her machine, said, "I really support this idea. I think it's great. Um, I'm in touch with uh, Green Party MP Mike Morris talking about this idea. And so now we have uh, like another another vote at the convention. So it's, if you just look at Justin Trudeau, it gets it seems like, oh man, how do we do that, right? But if you look at everybody else." That's how we're going to win it. And Justin Trudeau won't be here forever. He, he won't, his personal opinion will not decide this issue forever. Thank you. Uh, then we have uh, Athi. Uh, keep your question short, please, Athi. Thank you. Sure. I'm talking to you from Finland, which has had proportional representation for over 30 years. And I'm not going to go into the discontents of this, but too much, but uh, we had just decided that we're going to join NATO and uh, be part of the uh, mutually assured mass destruction uh, strategy, for instance, uh, and we use the proportional system to do this. And uh, the proportional system has really silenced everybody with different uh, opinions uh, or against, against this because they'll be out in the political cold. Uh, uh, so this is a weakness of this system is the fact that you have to cooperate or you're not included at all. But I want to ask you, uh, I, I, I've gone through these, these cycles with the, the pre-McGuinty in Ontario and now with Trudeau and both of these were governments that more or less favored this idea ori uh, originally. And, uh, and even ran on this, and uh, uh, but the, but they all bogged down. Uh, where I uh, assume that you're going to uh, bring up the citizens' assembly as a way to solve the problem, and that is really the question of how do you do proportional representation? It's the details, the devil of proportional representation. I've seen this twice over. I'm, I'm old enough to see it. That. The problem is in the details. In a country like Canada, people will add, first first glance, say, yes, that's a great idea. I get the vote and I, I, I get influence. But how do you actually do the formula for a country like, such a regional, disparate country like Canada to make this thing work? Uh, and uh, do you have a formula that you are working on and trying to make uh, known in the Liberal Party and, and among people who support this so that we don't get mixed up in the details and, and do what happened in BC where everybody just gets all burned out uh, disagreeing over various things and we can't get any kind of consensus because the fault, uh, the failure both uh, the, the, the two times that as far as I understand the McGinty uh, 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 government in Ontario and the, the tr why Trudeau turned around is just because there wasn't enough of a consensus on how actually to do this because there wasn't enough work within the movement to support for her proportional representation to really really think clearly and put forth the program how how technically this is going to work in Canada because that's what's going to blow it apart again if, if you don't do that work don't say it's too complicated too difficult you can't do it or we'll do it later or give it to a student assembly we need proponents out there now with the right formula for doing this in Canada Can you tell me your first name again? I missed it. Ahti. Ahti? Mm -hmm. No, that's all right. Ah, ah, Ahti. Okay. No. All right. There was no. Don't okay. Answer my question. Don't try to pronounce my name. <laughs> you had about five questions in there, so yes. it's, it's really hard to know exactly what to uh, what to address. So I'll try to. I'm sure I'm not gonna address them all to your satisfaction, but I will do the best that I can. Um, so yes, for sure, in, in proportional countries, 
uh, there's no magic. It's not like, you know, we're going to always get the policies that we want. All it guarantees really is that you can help elect somebody and that the parties will work together. And, and if you have a, a good system, if there's MPs you're not happy with, you can also help give, give them the boot. It definitely does require cooperation and compromise, and sometimes people are not happy with those compromises. And I think that's gonna that's gonna happen in any country. So I don't know exactly how to address that. The alternative of giving all the power to one party, which then basically means all the power with one person and their unelected advisors, is the other alternative. We're living that now, and the overall research shows it's not as good. So I mean, that would be the only way I could address the. Um, the situation you referred to in Finland. Okay, in terms of pushing one particular electoral system, if if we thought, since we've been at this for 21 years now, seven referendums, countless committees, 17 studies in Canada in the last 100 years, if I thought that just let's all just find the right system and all just push for that one. If I thought that would get us one inch closer to success, we'd be all in because it seems like the common sense solution. Why can't you just sort of pick the right one and just agree and then we'll all have a consensus and just push that. Otherwise, people get confused. They don't know how it works. Unfortunately, it's just not that simple. The parties do not agree on a system. They are not going to agree on a system. So when everybody has their pet system. The NDP has a pet system. The Liberals have a pet system. The Greens are the only ones who are open-minded. Um, you know, and they all just fight a battle of the systems. We get nothing. We get what we got in 2016. We get no consensus. And that's because it's not that they, on the 2016 ERE committee, which they spent five months, they heard from hundreds of experts, there were three different bodies that went around Canada doing town halls and all this kind of stuff. And there's only been two proportional systems, two frameworks that have been recommended every single study for the last 100 years. That is the mixed member system and the proportional ranked ballot, single transferable vote, not the winner take all one, the proportional one. Those two frameworks are the frameworks that keep local representation deliver a moderately proportional results and are eminently workable in Canada. There's no lack of ways to design this that are, are practical, workable. People could easily use it, catch on to it, and it's used in other parts of the world. The problem is the politics. The problem is the parties that don't want to give up all the power that they get when they get 39% of the vote. That's the, that what we're trying to overcome is not a design problem or a which good system to pick problem. It's a political problem. And that's why we're focused on getting a next step of a process for a citizens assembly to look at that. In terms of what Canadians will support, I am not sure myself, I actually don't think it's realistic to expect that Faro Canada or any anybody actually is going to educate 35 million people on the mechanics of any electoral system. Half of the people in Canada don't have any idea how first past the post works, quite frankly. They can't explain to you how a majority government is elected with less than a majority of a vote. So what we're trying to do is build a process that people can trust because they will, when they use it, they will learn and they will support the principle. But there's no country I don't think that you can go to, including proportional countries, where you ask the average person on the street and they can explain to you the mechanics of their electoral system. They can explain to you the general idea. They can explain to you whether they think it's fair. And that is pretty much as much as we're going to get. If When we are talking systems, we're losing. So I've heard this from countless people, countless experts, countless political strategists, and countless people with common sense. When you're explaining mechanics, you're losing. <laughs> when you're talking about things that people care about, issues that are close to their heart, the feeling of having no voice on those issues, being unhappy with not being represented on those issues, then we're starting to get some traction. And that's why we're getting, we're getting a broader consensus among the parties for this idea of a citizens assembly than we ever would at this point anyway, at this point on any particular system. I think that's, I follow up on that? I think uh, that's 
we are sort or, of running out of time. I still have two questions, but if you keep it very short, Avi. Well, you're the expert. You're Fair World Canada. Are you telling me that you can't agree on which system is the best among yourself? And if you can't agree to that, how do you expect the political parties or some citizens' assembly to agree to something like that? I think somehow I'm not explaining it. It's like, um, it's not that we couldn't agree. I, I think maybe 10 years ago, there was a lot more, the small group of geeks would squabble, right? I mean, and I'm not saying that there's still not those people, but generally cold, hard political reality has brought everyone together in the past mm, almost 10 years to basically say that we are happy in Fairboat Canada with a proportional system that meets some basic criteria, such as maintaining local representation. You know, there's a bunch of principles and values and that there are two broad frameworks for PR systems and that we would be happy with either one of them. So if the Liberal Party, if Justin Trudeau woke up tomorrow morning and said, I like this proportional system, we would say, you're on. But for us to go out there saying, this is the system, this is the only one, and we're just gonna promote this, it doesn't help us build the political consensus that we need. If it did, we would do it, but it just, it just doesn't. Okay, thank we, you. We can disagree on that. Fine, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have a question and then Andy. Oh, Andy withdrew the question? Or... Yeah, I think I need I need a basically answer it or made the point that I wanted to say in response oh. to Ati. It's it's not really up to Federal Canada or any organization to dictate what system Canadians should use. It should be uh, a system where Canadian citizens have involvement in say in choosing their own electoral system. Right. Okay, I have a question from Adina Leon in Winnipeg. And uh, under any PR system, if there are more eligible seats than one in a riding, are candidates elected according to the number of votes until all seats are filled? Is the prime minister, for instance, chosen by collaboration of number of votes for a party? That was her question. Okay, so there's like two different questions there. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> one is how is the prime minister selected and the other one is going back to um, how do Speed. PR systems work? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think how the proportional, the two main frameworks for proportional representation work is sort of beyond what I could cover in like the next one minute without <laughs> Every, and without everybody's eyes going, you know, you really want to know until, until you don't. So we have special uh, sessions for anybody who really wants to dig in. Let me just give you the framework. And if I lose anybody, my apologies. It's really not that hard if I could show you a sample ballot. Okay, two frameworks. One is you still elect a single local MP using first past the post. In addition to that, you elect regional MPs from your region. The overall percentage of seats in parliament will match the overall percentage of the vote. If a party doesn't win enough of those local ridings, think about the Liberals and NDP in Alberta, for example. You know, If they don't win enough first past the post races, their voters will help elect regional MPs. So you'll have uh, local MPs and regional MPs in your parliament. As a voter, you can go to your local MP or you can go to your regional MP and you'll have several MPs of different parties representing your riding. It's not like one MP has a monopoly on the riding. That would be called a mixed member system. Second system, single transferable vote. Let's say you have five ridings in Brampton. I'm just giving you guys an example, right? So we have Brampton East, Brampton West, Brampton North, whatever, you know, okay? Instead of five ridings, that each elect one MP, and guess what? They're all liberal, 100% liberals, right? Did 100% did of people in Brampton vote liberal? No, probably like half of them did. Who represents the other half? So with single transferable vote, instead of electing one MP in each riding, you would have one larger riding that elects five MPs. And those MPs would be proportional to the vote. So if the liberals got about, liberal candidates got about 40% of the vote in that little area, they would get two of the five MPs, you know, maybe the conservatives would get two and the NDP would get one. It would just vary by um, 
you know, vary by election and by region. So in both cases, proportional systems for Canada mean you have local MPs, you have MPs you can go to that represent different parties, and your vote will help elect somebody in your area that you actually want to represent you. So that was that's that. Um, the prime how the prime minister is selected is a totally different question. We're talking about how coalition governments work. So after an election, the parties sit down to negotiate. Sometimes there are hundreds of negotiators, as you've seen in Germany. They took weeks, hundreds of them, uh, MPs. Uh, went into a room, ones that were experts on different subjects would negotiate in different areas. They decide they decide which parties have something in common, which parties can work together. Now, usually it's the leader of the largest party that they're, that would have the prime minister, um, that their leader would become the prime minister. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You know, so when you look at Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, um, not this last election, but the one before, her party did not win the most votes. The party that won the most votes was the right-wing party, the National Party. But because Jacinda was able to negotiate with two other parties, she was able to become prime minister, even though she wasn't the leader of the party that had the most votes. Between them, those three parties formed a majority, and those were the parties that had uh, policies in common that represented the majority of New Zealand voters at the time. So that's how she became prime minister. So it just it depends on the negotiation uh, between the parties and the coalition. I hope that is sort of what you were asking. Great, thank you very much, uh, Anita. Uh, now I'll give uh, Jake one minute to say one more thing, okay? Thank you very much, I'll be very brief. Uh, with my talk, I gave the impression that the only problem right now in Israel is taking that veto power from the Supreme Court. And why it is so important, that's because the new government, which uh, those religious fanatics and fascists and racists form a coalition with Netanyahu, they want to bring all kinds of laws, which they started already. For example, they want to have that women cannot have any portfolio, senior portfolios in the government. They have to wear the scarf. They have to be subservient to men. There will be a lot more religious studies in the school. They are totally against LGBTQ people and so on. And that's why it came down to the Supreme Court veto power. It's so important because since Israel doesn't have constitution, that's the only one that can maybe resist to some of those which will send Israel backward like those other countries, which I won't mention. So this is the thing, the problems that what they want to bring, the laws that they want to bring, which they already started. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, then we are uh, now done with the, uh, um, I will share the screen again with the, uh, uh, Q and A. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for your patience. I know we have run out of time. We are over time right now. Um, uh, the uh, next uh, meeting will be at the end of, well, also on the twenty fifth of March, at the end of uh, March, uh, same time, uh, same place, uh, usual suspects. Uh, we will have. Uh, uh, Katharina Lindman and uh, Katharina will explore important questions about the food system, a better food system. In some ways, getting a better food system is easy since there are so many issues with our current food system. The talk will explore the state of our food system, how we got there, and uh, where to go next in our creating food system that is better than our current one. And uh, she is a retired actuary, grandmother, and activist. And her interests include basic income, climate change mit mitigation, nonviolent communication, and whole plant based foods. And here is basically a, a, a graph about uh, what influence uh, emissions uh, are uh, from protein rich foods, uh, and, and animal protein is, is, is a big uh, part of that. 
Anyway, uh, Katrina, you're here. Uh, do you want to, to speak? Sure. I'll just say, um, yeah, I enjoyed this presentation. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to coming back next month and talking about the food system. Great, thank you so much. Then um, we will uh, finish this. Um, oh, where is my share screen there? Uh, this this um, presentation with a chalice lighting. Oh, that's the wrong one. Excuse me, stop share. I had the wrong screen here. Uh, there. And slideshow. Oh, this thing is in the way again. This is, uh, come on. Okay, there we go. My apologies for the bungling around here. Um, so thank you all for, for being there. Uh, the chalice extinguishing. We are all keepers of the light, that it might shine our love, equity, and justice. As we symbolically extinguish this light, may the memory of its flame sustain our joy of commitment to lighting it again, again, and again, for those who cannot yet light their own. So thank you for joining us, and see you next month for the new food system with Katrina Lindman. And um, we have some resources and just briefly showing it. We will send uh, resources uh, more extensively around. So don't forget if you are a member to renew your membership or if you want to become a, uh, a member, uh, you can go to csj.org and, and add to memory. We will also set, uh, uh, post that in our mailing. So thank you very much for being here and stay safe and keep the justice and compassion going. Thank you very one, much. One thing, um, something that we do after after meetings, after things, something we do sometimes is we uh, sing our benediction and then we have a little thing after it. So if you want, we can do do this. So we can't raise hands. We have here also people that are not Unitarian, Jim. So I think uh, the challenge. Well, say, so say we all. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Jim. And thank you all. And uh, hope to see you next time. And yes, Margaret, we had your issue also addressed. Okay. Bye now. I will end the uh, meeting. Thank you.